And if you'll open your Bibles for preaching this morning to Acts chapter 9, begin in verse number 1. I'm speaking on the subject this morning, thankful to know Him. Our theme for the year has been knowing Him in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. These will be taken down and we will be preparing a new theme for uh, next year. And so I wanted to speak on knowing Him but relating it to Thanksgiving. And so thankful to know Him. In Acts chapter 9, we have the conversion of the Apostle Paul. It was an amazing conversion, but it's the same conversion that we all have. The ingredients and elements in Paul's experience are in all of our experience. And I hope when we're done that you will be, th you will be thankful, as I am, that you know him. Beginning in verse number 1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues. Now it's believed that in Damascus that there could have been as many as 40 synagogues in that city. Actually, it's interesting that the word synagogue is the same word for assembly, and when they talked about assemblies in the New Testament, it related to the synagogue. And so Paul knew that he had purged most of Jerusalem, but he didn't stop there. He wanted to exterminate Christianity. And so he was on his way to make another big dent in Christianity. And on his way, the Bible says, he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if, any, any, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And so these people were going to be punished for believing in the truth. Well, as all of us in our life have big plans and we make many statements and we make many, many plans to do certain things, it says, as he journeyed, as he, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Leave your finger there, and I want, to, want you to listen to his testimony in Acts chapter 22, and then Acts chapter 26. And we're going to read <clears throat> what he himself says of this light. And verse 6 of chapter 22, he's, he's giving a testimony. He says, And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, as bright as, I mean, that's, that's the, the middle of the day. I mean, that's, that's when normally the sun is at its highest point. At noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Go to chapter 26. He is now before King Agrippa. And then there's another man named Felix <clears throat> who uh, comes into the picture. And verse number... Let's go to chapter 26 and verse... Number thirteen. No, let's go. We'll start at verse eleven. He says, "And I punished them oft in every synagogue." Again, he's describing what his intent was prior to coming to Damascus, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness 
of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me. And so <clears throat> this light was not just any light. It wasn't lightning. It wasn't a star. It was the light of God that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. We won't take the time, but if you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul references to the fact he saw Jesus. And the Bible says, <clears throat> there was a man sent from God, his name was John. The same came to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light, that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus is the light. And that's the first thing I'm thankful for this morning. I'm thankful that I saw the light. We've all heard the song, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more night. I'm, one, I, I'm thrilled that God opened my eyes. You know, the wonder is, is God gives light to every man. The question is, that, I, I've been asked this question. Um, I went back this week and I had, had a young man I came across um, at, a, at a Starbucks this week and I was very encouraged. This young man had uh, gone to college and had, had got a business degree, had got a bachelor's, had got a master's, and this year he felt God calling him to ministry and he, he just walked away from it. And he says, I, I hope one day to start a church. And I, I was very encouraged. And we talked about the importance of ministry. And I began to reflect back, and I had forgotten, you know, I, you know I've, I told him, I said, it's been 36 years of ministry and 41 years of preaching, but it's actually been 38 years of ministry and 41 years, soon to be 42 years, and soon to be 39 years of ministry. But I remember the very first day. When I saw the, when I saw the light. When Jesus opened my eyes as a 14-year-old boy. Seems like yesterday. See, I was a farm kid. Grew up in obscurity. I had a mom that knew Jesus. I had a dad that loved money. And it wasn't until we left the farm and we went into business and the oil industry managing shell stations that my dad on one Thursday night, August 19th, 1971, trusted Christ. And I asked him what happened to him. And he said, I got saved. And he thought I knew that, what that meant. It wasn't until two years after that conversation that we moved to the Midwest. And I was sitting in a service and I heard for the first time a man of God that, that had a passion for the word and had a passion for the gospel. And he preached a message on the lake of fire that rocked my world as a teenage boy. It's insulting to me to hear men of God or anybody that throws water on the urgency of preaching on an eternal hell. Because I, as a 14-year-old boy, had never thought of myself as being deserving of hell. And so I never placed myself there. But for the first time in my life, as a 14-year-old boy, and I was a brilliant kid, I was 4.0 in high school, I wasn't, I, was, I wasn't just, you know, off the boat. I knew... I knew a lot of things, but one thing I didn't realize is how much of a sinner I was, but I did then. I didn't get saved that service, but it was on a Sunday night, <clears throat> a couple months later, December 9th, 1973, my spiritual birthday is going to be coming up. I will be saved 43 years. 
And again, it just seems like yesterday. I saw the light. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm glad that Jesus showed me the light. And I hope that you this morning are thankful that he showed you the light. And you can go back in your heart and back into your mind to that day, that wonderful day where you opened your heart to Jesus and as you saw the light, you got saved. Paul had never seen anything like it. And by the way, I'm talking about spiritual light. I'm not talking about a light that is like the sun or the moon or the stars. I'm talking about the light of God. Make no mistake, God gives every man an opportunity to see that light. But not everybody will come to the light. Because the Bible is very clear in John chapter 3, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so I'm thankful God opened my heart up and allowed me to see the light and that I responded. First, I'm thankful to see the light. Secondly, in verse 4, note what it says. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The second thing that I'm glad that in knowing him, I'm thankful to know him because he knows my name. He called Paul by name. But he called Brent Ford by name. Oh, not audibly. Not like Paul. But in here. And I'm glad that he knows my name. Even after 43 years. I still feel like I'm that 14 year old kid. Who. Finally, finally fell in love with. The best friend that you could ever have in the world. His name is Jesus. He knows my name. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. They know me and they follow me. And the Bible says, just like the stars, He calleth them all by name. He knows our name. Aren't you glad He knows your name? If you don't, if you don't know Him, He knows everything about you. And He would love to have you know his name the wonderful God of the universe so Paul is addressed by Almighty God by the way he not only addresses adults he addresses children one of my favorite stories in the scriptures is a little boy about a little boy who was dedicated to God by his mother whose name was Samuel his mother was a very godly woman and she was praying for God to give her a son because she was barren. Well, God answered that prayer. And she came to the temple and <clears throat> she prayed. And as she was praying, she was so distraught. The Bible says the words were not coming out of her mouth. She was just moving her mouth. And the priest judged her, Eli, because he thought she was drunk. And she says, no, no, uh, no, sir, I'm not. I'm not. She said, that this is what my request is. And so he, he asked the Lord to grant the request. And one year later, or nine months later, she came back to the temple. And she had had a little boy. But here was the deal. In her prayer, she promised God, I'll give him back to you. For whatever you choose to do with him. And so she did. The Bible says after he was weaned, he was brought up to the temple. She left him there, and it was the responsibility of Eli to take care of this little boy. About four years of age, he was in his room. He had been taught respect at home. He'd been taught to behave. He'd been taught responsibility. And so <clears throat> he heard a voice, Samuel, Samuel. He jumped out of bed. He went running down the hall. He knocked on the door of his, 
of his mentor, Eli, and he said, here am I. And Eli said, um, son, I didn't, I didn't call you. It's late. You need to go back to bed. Twice that happened. He did one more time. And the Bible says in that time there was no open vision. It was a dark time in Israel. And Eli wasn't right. And his sons weren't right. And so <clears throat> the message of God was, was, was not being preached and taught. And God was raising up a little boy. The second time he ran down the hall and he knocked on the door, he told him, he says, you go back to your room. And he said, if you hear the voice again, you say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Well, God did speak to him again. He called him Samuel. And I'm glad that he knows little boys. And I'm glad that he knows big boys. And he knows little girls. And he knows big girls. He knows everyone by name. That's comforting. Because it's personal. I am so glad that my Father in Heaven tells of His love in the book He has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest. That Jesus loves me. I'm thankful He knows my name. Number three, I'm thankful to hear His voice. In verse 5, Paul had, in verse 4, had asked the question, or had heard the voice, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? But he didn't recognize the voice. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I'm thankful to hear his voice. The wonder of a child of God is <clears throat> he, his voice is, is available for all of us to hear. As I said, it's not audible. The Bible says he speaks of a still small voice. God speaks to us internally. And all I'm thankful to hear his voice. I'm thankful that I heard his voice asking me to come and to be saved. But I'm also thankful that I'm able to hear his voice every day, anytime. He's a wonderful, wonderful God and a wonderful Savior. So Paul is introduced for the very first time to someone who he hated someone who he thought was, was evil. Somebody who he misunderstood. And look at the response when he hears the voice in verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? When he heard his voice, it changed him. He went from being adamantly and angrily and hateful to the cause of Christ to just simply total submission to the will of God. And I'm thankful this morning to submit to the will of God. <clears throat> Paul, that was the turning point in Paul's life. I don't know what was going through his mind, but the Bible says he was trembling and he was astonished. The light came on and the realization, oh my, I've been wrong all this time. Messiah has been somebody that's been here all the time. 
And what I've heard before, what I've, what I've heard from, from all of the, the disciples of Christ and all these people, the apostles and the others that I've been persecuting, it's all been true. When I stood at the, the first martyr of the church, Stephen, and I held his coat and I consented unto his death, that was all true. And so he says to God in verse 6, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Are you thankful this morning for these things? Are you happy to submit to his will? I'm also thankful to obey his word. Verse 8 to 12, it says, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And isn't, there it is. God knows our name. Paul didn't know him, but God knew him. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard, many by, heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. I'm glad that he's given me the opportunity, he's given all of us the opportunity, thankful that he has given us an opportunity to obey his word. Paul did exactly what God said. And because he did what God said, God orchestrated all of the details. God knew where Judas was. He knew where, that Ananias was there. He knew where Paul was. He knew how to guide Ananias to find Paul. He knew it all. So Paul obeyed. Ananias obeyed. And God's will and God's plan was fulfilled. The wonder of obeying his word is it's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus obeyed the will of the Father. He obeyed the word of the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm thankful to obey his word. Then I'm thankful that he, he chose me as a vessel. In verse 15, it says, Paul, through Ananias, or actually the Lord now interrupts Ananias, and <clears throat> he tells Ananias what he's going to do with Paul. And then Ananias later reiterates this to the apostle Paul. But here's what he, he writes. Here's what the Lord says directly to Paul, or to Ananias. Go thy way, and listen to what he says about Paul. For he is a chosen vessel unto me. What a privilege as a child of God. We are chosen as a vessel. Channels only, blessed master. That's all we are. We're a channel. Christ in you, the hope of glory, allowing him to flow through us. Thou canst use us every day and every hour. What a privilege to be chosen as a vessel. We're chosen because we put our faith and trust in Christ. 
but we weren't just chosen and left with nothing to do. Whether you realize it or not, as a child of God, you were chosen for big things. You were chosen for God's things. And you may not do the same things in the magnitude of an Apostle Paul, or of a Peter, or of a John, or of a James. But God has chosen you to be you with all of the abilities and all of the talents and all of the gifts that you have been given to do what only you can do where you're at for Him. And don't minimize that. God has a plan for you. I've gone back at this week <clears throat> and I thought back of all those 38 years since I've been in ministry and where God has taken me and the different places that he's, he's placed me and, and the people who I've touched. <clears throat> and here, here's, let me, let me just make it very, just be very transparent with you. All preachers want to be used in, a, in the greatest way they can. But God doesn't choose everybody to do something amazing and beyond. But what He chooses us to do is to go where He tells us and to do what He commissions us wherever it is and whatever it is for His glory. And sometimes, especially younger men, are not satisfied with that because they think that there's something more. There's nothing that's any more special than to be called and to do what God has chosen for you to do where He has you. And so <clears throat> I'm thankful to be a chosen vessel for His service. Then I'm thankful to suffer for him. In verse 16, he said to Ananias of Paul, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Jesus said, all they that live godly, it's not just talking to preachers, not just talking about apostles, yea, all those that live godly shall suffer persecution. It doesn't matter whether it's persecution, whether it's trial, whatever it is, I'm thankful for what he, the path that He has chosen for me. And I hope that you're thankful for what He has chosen for you. Thankful just to know Him. In verse, in verse 18, I'm thankful to identify with Him. In verse 18, it says, And immediately there fell from His eyes, as it had been scales, and He received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. I remember that day in my life. I got saved, but I'd never made it public. And <clears throat> so I decided that on that day, that I, I was saved on Sunday night, and our church was set up to do it right then on the spot. And so I walked forward, and I didn't know why I didn't know what God was going to do with that but he did by me identifying with Christ in, our, in the baptistry that we had at that church I had a friend my best friend named Matt we, we just hit it off from the beginning and, and uh, we did all kinds of stuff together he was raised in a Christian home like me, very much like me. He had been told by his parents that he had been saved. But he was having doubts. And so that Sunday night, December 9, 1973, when I put my faith and trust in Christ, and I chose to identify with Jesus as my Savior and show people that I believed in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he was watching me as I 
got baptized. There were two people that were that met me down at the bottom of the stairs when I was done. Our baptistry was up high and you had to climb upstairs to get there and um, and so first it was my friend and then it was my coach who coached a pr he was my principal and coached several sports that I played but my friend told me this he was he was 14 as well he said Brent I'm proud of you he said this 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 was a, a very courageous thing that you did. I, I didn't look at it as such, but here's what happened. We were sitting in church the next Sunday morning. And when people in our church would get saved, we would read the names, and then they would come forward to be baptized. And, and so I'm sitting there on Sunday night, and I all of a sudden hear Matt's name being read. And I thought that was this is that that's odd. And I realized that he put his faith and trust in Christ because I had identified with Christ. And he got baptized. And so guess who met him at the bottom of the stairs? Me and that same coach. I'm thankful that I identified with Jesus that I identified with the fact that he died for me. He was buried for me, which pictured my sins were, were gone. They were washed away. And when I came up out of the water, that I identified with his resurrection, that I, I identified with a living savior who could give me the power to do anything that he had called me to do. I'm thankful that I identified with him. Verse nine, or verse nineteen, I'm thankful to be felt, to, thankful for the fellowship, or to fellowship with other believers. After he was baptized and God opened his eyes, note what what it says in verse nineteen. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. Now imagine that meeting. Every one of those people knew why he had come to Damascus. What a switch. What an amazing, miraculous change that here, the man that was there to have them punished and maybe to even have them killed is now shaking their hand and is now a believer in Jesus Christ. Imagine that. I'm thankful to the, for the fellowship of believers. The bond, the closeness, the relationship that we can have, the commonality that we can have with fellow believers. It's very important that we have that in our Christian life. And then finally in verse 20, the Bible says, and straightway immediately after he spent the time with the disciples and he visited with those other believers in those synagogues in Damascus. It says straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I'm thankful to preach Christ. We have a lot to be thankful for. The most amazing privilege that all of us have, and I'm not talking about preaching Christ because I'm a pastor. I'm talking about sharing the gospel. We all have that privilege. And we can be thankful that because we're saved and because of all he's done for us, that we have been given the privilege to speak his name and to speak for him and to share Christ. Do we have a lot to be thankful for at Christmas or Thanksgiving? Absolutely. More than we could ever thank him for. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to even know you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.